It's time to sit back, relax, and listen to Conversations with Joan. Conversations with Joan will inspire, motivate, and empower you. Live your best life now. Listen, learn, think, and decide. And now, here's your host, Joan Herman. Welcome to Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life's Conversations with Joan. I'm Joan Herman. Thanks for tuning in. With the coronavirus outbreak, the world as we know it has been rapidly changing. Schools and businesses are closed, social distancing requirements have been implemented, supermarket shelves are bare, and many are concerned about how they will pay their bills. With all of this in mind, we are offering a series of shows to help you navigate this uncharted territory. We will focus on the various areas of life to help you and your loved ones stay well and strong. Much has been shared on how to protect yourself from physical risk, but what about your mental health? Joining me today to discuss why it is so important to stay healthy mentally is Dr. Robert Bright, a Mayo Clinic psychiatrist who specializes in mood and psychotic disorders and psychiatric issues in the medically ill. Welcome, Dr. Bright. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So, Doctor, before we get into any of your recommendations, let's start off with why it is so important that we stay mentally strong. Well, this is an unprecedented time within our lifetimes, um, as an obvious understatement, I think. And everyone is very stressed. There, there are folks who have struggled for a long time with mental illness, anxiety, and depression, and this is very difficult for them and people who were sort of subclinically going along, but this is, is overwhelming to them, and, and it's normal for anyone to feel anxious about what's going on, and it's so important that we nurture and take care of ourselves during this time so that we can approach it with a resilient attitude and get through this individually and together. Doctor, you just mentioned that it's normal to feel anxious. What are some other things that would be quote-unquote normal feelings, and, and what should be a red flag that there might be a problem? So the anxiety here is being stirred by what's unknown. We don't know exactly what to expect and what's coming, Um, and anxiety is a big component of that. And uh, the other thing we need to be really mindful of and watching for is the possibility of depression, Um, the sense of loss of control and the sense of helplessness within the context of this can be a trigger for depression and people who are vulnerable to that. So to recognize that um, someone is drifting into those things, that they're feeling overwhelmed, that they're not sleeping, that they're having anxiety attacks, that they're having bad dreams, that they're ruminating and having intrusive thoughts and just going over and over this with this in their mind, or if they're really withdrawing from the people around them and they're crying all the time and feeling hopeless and worthless, um, lost, losing their appetite. Depression and anxiety are people. We're, it's a time of vulnerability to those things, and um, in New York, this just hits so hard, and it's so prevalent and so overwhelming that I really want people to check in with themselves, both physically when you're, you know, checking your temperature and all of those things and keeping your social distance, but check in with yourself emotionally and psychologically as well. We've got to take care of ourselves. Doctor, what about our children? Their lives have been uprooted. They've been taken out of school, which was very social for them. There are no graduations, sporting events, proms are canceled. How can we best explain the situation to our children? You know, I think the first and most important thing I want to say is to be honest with them, to not um, hold things back because they're going to recognize that, but to do that in a way that's age-appropriate, using language that they can understand. For example, for a young child, you may say that, you know, there's this, this virus going around, just like colds go around, and sometimes people catch colds. And we need to be careful to take care of ourselves so that we don't get sick and make sure that if we have a cold, we don't get somebody else sick. And to use language like that that they can understand, to really be open to their questions and invite them and to validate their concerns and fears as as real, to let them know that you are there with them for this, to not allow them to be constantly exposed to the media. This is very overwhelming for a child who really has no context for this and can't understand the images and the words that are on television. Be mindful if they're in the background as you're watching it, but limit that stuff and then bring it to them in a way that you can kind of present it to them and tell them, I'm going to keep you up to date, I'm going to let you know what's going on, and bring it to them in a way that you can control and help manage um, their anxiety. I think it can be very helpful as well to establish ways in which they can be in some sense of control of this. So 
we're going to do what we can. We're going to listen to the doctors, and they're telling us what we can do to stay healthy and keep other people healthy. We're going to do the, the hand washing and the birthday song. Um, we're, you know, well, something you can do is cover your mouth when you sneeze or cough. That can help take care of, of other people when we're going through this. And, and I heard someone d- describe this, and I really loved it. Kids don't know what six feet is when we're talking about social distancing, but they know what a bicycle is. And I really love this because we can say, imagine a bicycle between you and that other person, and be sure to try to keep that distance between them. Now, this is for a situation where you can actually go out. I know in New York you guys are really more limited in that. But it's a good way of talking with kids and to use terms like that. Just as an example of, of a way to talk to them and explain this in a way that they can kind of wrap their heads around and not be overwhelmed by it. And when you give them an action that they can do and you tell them that they're helping to solve the situation, does that make them feel more empowered? Yes. More empowered, more in control, and less overwhelmed. Absolutely, that's right. So the Mayo Clinic suggests that we follow six simple rules to help us navigate this terrain. Can you bring us through these six rules? Well, I sort of just touched on those, and those are those healthy habits of diet, um, getting adequate sleep, doing exercise, keeping a schedule, um, and organizing yourself so that there's a pattern to your day. The other thing I want to really emphasize is communication to reach out, um, and there's two components of that. There's media communication for us adults. We were talking about the kids, but for ourselves, it's so overwhelming for us if we're sitting and constantly watching and seeing the images and hearing the stories. I find that for myself, and I found it to be really helpful, and I would recommend to other people to take that in manageable scheduled chunks. So once or twice a day, sit with that stuff for 15 to 30 minutes perhaps. Get the information that you need know what's going on without being so overwhelmed with it. And then within all of that, find sources that you find to be reliable um, and independent and objective in the information you're getting, places, um, uh, media outlets without a political agenda or a sensationalistic, ratings-driven, scary body uh, agenda, to find a source that you can trust and doesn't fuel your own anxiety. And then with, uh, with other people, I'd say the same thing about communication. Um, find people who are nurturing and supportive for you and helpful for your anxiety and set limits or even distance yourself from people who are just really cranking up and scaring you to death and I heard this and I saw that and what if and all of that stuff. you got to kind of check in with yourself and recognize is this helpful or is this not helpful. And the other um, thing I want to really emphasize there as far as those, those things you were referencing is refilling your own take, tank and taking care of yourself. We need to step back and to kind of modulate our anxiety and help um, ourselves manage this. So to do things like, um, you know, I'm old enough that I go back to the 80s and 90s, and I, pulling out that old music from back then that's familiar, I find mm-hmm. to be really comforting and really familiar and to sing along or to whatever. It's just great. And I have a collection of DVDs, again, giving away my age there. But pulling out some old movies, um, some might be humor, it might be a serious drama, whatever it was, but something I own in my library because I liked and I haven't watched in forever, and it's just really soothing and comforting. Um, things like meditation, sitting and relaxing, doing deep breathing, bringing yourself into the current moment rather than getting lost into what could, might, should happen stuff that you know we don't really know and we can't control that, and um, approaching this with a degree of, of what's called radical acceptance, that here we are, and given where we are, what are we going to do? Here's the deck of hands. Here's the, the, um, the hand of cards we've been dealt. We didn't want it, but now we've got it. Where do we go from here? And what, what is in, as I said with the kids, what they can control? What's in our control that we can do to, to navigate our way through this, this difficult time? Doctor, is there a resource that you can recommend as a good source of information? Absolutely. So Mayo Clinic has some great resources. There's the Office of Patient Education, and there's also the Mayo Clinic News Network. I think those are good sources of information. The um, Anxiety and Depression Association of America has a website that I find to be really helpful. There's a website that I really like, and I would encourage um, people to take a look at it, called cyberguide.org. And that's P-S-Y, like psychiatry, B-E-R, like a cyborg, P-S-Y-B-E-R, guide, G-U-I-D-E, dot org. And what that is, I have no affiliation with these folks. It's a, it's a guide to online our, um, smartphone apps and programs and uh, resources that, that help people with self-directed management of symptoms of depression and anxiety, mindfulness meditation. There's these things I'm talking about. 
um, that you can do from home without having to leave um, and, connect, and do something in person. I think it's a great resource right now for people. An additional resource is the um, National Suicide Hotline and to reach out to somebody on by but there are local resources like that called warm lines where you can reach out and talk to somebody if you're in distress and certainly if you're having thoughts of self-harm please reach out to somebody and also our listeners can visit our website cyacyl.com because we have a lot of resources there as well doctor thank you so much for joining us and thank you for the work that you're doing and please be well thank you so much it was my pleasure thank you for having me. This is Conversations with Joan. Until next time, thanks for tuning in.